Welcome to ICU Primary Prepcast. Hi, I'm Nadi. Hi, I'm Swapnil. And today we are going to discuss about GIT pharmacology. Are you ready? Yeah. So let's start by simple question. Can you please classify drugs used for stress ulcer prophylaxis and briefly outline their mechanism of action? So drugs used for stress ulcer prophylaxis um, can be divided into three main mechanisms. Drugs that reduce gastric acid secretion, drugs that neutralize gastric acid, and drugs that promote mucosal defense. Firstly, drugs that reduce gastric acid secretion include proton pump inhibitors, H2 receptor blockers, anticholinergics, and prostaglandin analogs. Proton pump inhibitors are probably the most commonly used drug for stress ulcer prophylaxis in ICU. Examples of PPIs include pantoprazole. These bind to and inhibit the hydrogen potassium ATPase enzyme system, or proton pump, which is the final common pathway of gastric acid secretion. Proton pump inhibitors inhibit both fasting and meal-stimulated gastric acid secretion. H2 receptor blockers, such as ranitidine, are competitive antagonists of histamine 2 receptors on the basolateral surface of parietal cells. These suppress basal and meal stimulated acid secretion in a linear, dose dependent fashion. These receptors are normally stimulated by histamine released by enterochromaffin like cells, which then activate adenyl cyclase, which increases intracellular cyclic AMP, then activating protein kinases, and finally stimulating acid secretion by the hydrogen potassium ATPase or proton pump. H2 receptor blockers thus reduce acid secretion stimulated by histamine. Furthermore, direct stimulation of the parietal cells by gastrin or by acetylcholine has a reduced effect on acid secretion in the presence of H2 receptor blockade. Anticholinergic such as pirenzepine is a muscarinic receptor antagonist that binds to the M1 receptor reducing the acetylcholine-mediated stimulation of the proton pump, and thus reducing gastric acid secretion. And finally, prostaglandin analogues such as misoprostol are also examples of drugs that reduce gastric acid secretion. Prostaglandin E is produced by the gastric mucosa and results in inhibition of gastric acid secretion and stimulation of mucus and bicarbonate secretion. The second main category are drugs that neutralize gastric acids, such as antacids like Mylanta. These are weak bases that react with gastric acid to form a salt and water, thus reducing gastric acidity. They usually contain magnesium, aluminium, calcium or sodium. And finally, drugs that promote mucosal defense. The first example of this is sucrosulfate which is a salt of sucrose complex to sulfated aluminium hydroxide. It has a strong negative charge, which binds to positively charged proteins at the base of ulcers for up to six hours. This forms a coating, a coating which protects the ulcer from further injury and also stimulates the secretion of prostaglandin and bicarbonate, thus promoting mucosal defense. Finally, though not typically considered a drug, Entral feeding is another intervention that promotes mucosal defense. Early enteral feeding has been shown to reduce the risk of, st of stress ulceration in the ICU. There has been no proven benefit in adding pharmacological stress ulcer prophylaxis in patients who are tolerating full enteral feeds. Enteral feeding improves splanchnic blood flow, reduces bacterial translocation, reduces mucosal ulceration, and improves the integrity of gut mucosa. Almost every single patient in intensive care unit who is mechanically ventilated and not receiving NG feeds scores stress ulcer prophylaxis. Can you please compare and contrast the pharmacology of pantoprazole and ranitidine, the two most commonly used stress ulcer prophylaxis agents in ICU? Pantoprazole is a proton pump inhibitor, whilst ranitidine is a H2 receptor blocker. Both are used for the tr prevention and treatment of reflux, esophagitis, gastrointestinal ulcers, and in the treatment of gastronomas. And within ICU, they are, like you said, used for stress ulcer prophylaxis. Their pharmacology can be divided into pharmaceutics, pharmacokinetics, and pharmacodynamics. 
pharmaceutics. Both pantoprazole and ranitidine come in tablet and intravenous formulations, but ranitidine also comes in a syrup. Pantoprazole comes in tablets of 20 or 40 mg strengths, while ranitidine comes in 150 or 300 mg strengths. Their pharmacokinetics can be thought of in terms of their absorption, distribution, metabolism, and elimination. Absorption. Both pantoprazole and ranitidine have good oral absorption, but pantoprazole undergoes extensive first-pass metabolism, resulting in a bioavailability of 77%, whilst ranitidine has a lower bioavailability of just 50%. Both pantoprazole and ranitidine's absorption are not influenced by the presence of food. Distribution. Pantoprazole is highly protein bound at 98%, while ranitidine is only minimally protein bound at 15%. Pantoprazole has a volume of distribution of just 11 to 23 liters, while ranitidine has a larger volume of distribution of 1.4 liters per kilogram. In terms of the metabolism, ranitidine is hepatically metabolized to N-oxide, S-oxide, and N-desmethyl metabolites. Pantoprazole is also hepatically metabolized, but via the cytochrome P450 system. Both drugs have inactive metabolites. Pantoprazole should not be used in patients with severe hepatic impairment. Elimination. Both pantoprazole and ranitidine are excreted via the kidneys. However, approximately 20% of metabolites of pantoprazole are eliminated in the feces. Renal impairment requires dose reduction for ranitidine, but not for pantoprazole. The half-life of ranitidine is two hours, while that of pantoprazole is one hour. Pharmacodynamics. Pantoprazole is a proton pump inhibitor, which inhibits hydrogen potassium ATPase, which is the final pathway responsible for gastric acid secretion. Pantoprazole is a prodrug, which accumulates in the acidic canaliculi of parietal cells, where protonation converts it to the active compound sulfenamide. This forms an irreversible covalent bond with two sites of the proton pump, suppressing acid secretion for 24 to 48 hours until new proton pump molecules have been synthesized. Ranitidine is a H2 receptor blocker, which competitively inhibits histamine at the parietal cell H2 receptor, thus suppressing histamine-induced acid secretion. Adverse effects of pantoprazole are mainly gastrointestinal and include nausea, abdominal pain, constipation, and diarrhea. It can also increase the risk of Clostridium difficile infection, and chronic use can increase the risk of osteoporosis-related fractures. Pantoprazole has also been shown to have idiopathic hypersensitivity reactions, resulting in acute interstitial nephritis. Ranitidine is a very safe drug and has minimal adverse effects. Adverse reactions have been reported in about 3% of patients and include diarrhea, headache, fatigue, myalgia, confusion, rash, pancytopenia, and bradycardia. Due to the reduction in acid secretion, Pantoprazole can reduce the absorption of vitamin B12. It can also cause issues with the efficacy of other drugs due to the decreased gastric acidity, which may alter the absorption of drugs such as protease inhibitors used for HIV. As pantoprazole is metabolized by hepatic P450 cytochromes, including CYP2C19, there is a theoretical risk of drug interaction with medications that also require this enzyme. This is rarely clinically significant due to the short half-life of pantoprazole, but caution should be exercised with drugs such as warfarin and tacrolimus. Ranitidine has no known clinically significant drug interactions. Thank you. That, that's a very comprehensive answer. Now, let's move on to another class of agent that is very commonly used in intensive care. As almost every single agent that we prescribe in intensive care unit it has potential to cause nausea. So, can you please classify anti-emetic drugs and outline their mechanism of action? Okay. Firstly, I think it's important to understand the, some of the pathophysiology behind nausea and vomiting. So, the vomiting center in the brainstem is a neuronal region within the lateral medullary reticular formation, which coordinates vomiting through interactions with cranial nerves 8 and 10, and through networks in the nucleus tractus solitaris. 
This center has high concentrations of muscarinic M1, histamine H1, neurokinin 1, and serotonin 5-HT3 receptors. There are four main afferent inputs to this center. Number one is the chemoreceptor trigger zone, or area postrema, in the caudal end of the fourth ventricle. This is outside the blood-brain barrier and has dopamine D2 receptors, opioid receptors, 5-HT3 receptors, and NK1 receptors. Secondly, the vestibular system, which is via cranial nerve 8 and is important in motion sickness and is full of muscarinic M1 receptors and histamine H1 receptors. Thirdly, vagal and spinal afferent nerves from the gastrointestinal tracts, which are rich in 5-HT3 receptors and mechanoreceptors. And finally, the central nervous system itself, including the cortex, thalamus, hypothalamus, and meninges. Antiemetics therefore act on these different inputs and receptors to reduce nausea and vomiting. They can be classified by their receptor target into muscarinic receptor antagonists, H1 receptor antagonists, dopamine antagonists, 5-HT3 antagonists, neurokinin-1 receptor antagonists, cannabinoids, and glucocorticoids. Muscarinic receptor antagonists such as hyacine antagonize the M1 receptors within the vestibular system, nucleus tractus solitaris, and vomiting center. They are especially useful in motion sickness, but have a high incidence of side effects due to anticholinergic activity. H1 receptor antagonists such as promethazine inhibit H1 mediated activation of the vomiting center. They are particularly useful in motion sickness due to the presence of histamine receptors in the vestibular system and are also used for drug-induced nausea. Dopamine antagonists such as metoclopramide or droperidol inhibit D2 receptors in the chemoreceptor trigger zone, thus reducing its activation of the vomit center. They are particularly useful for cytotoxic-induced and post-operative nausea and vomiting. 5-HT3 antagonists such as ondansetron causes central 5-HT3 receptor blockade in the chemoreceptor trigger zone and vomiting center, but also blocks peripheral 5-HT3 receptors on intrin extrinsic intestinal vagal and spinal afferent nerves. The antiemetic action of these drugs is only effective in cases of nausea secondary to vagal stimulation, such as postoperatively or from chemotherapy-induced nausea. Neurokinin-1 receptor antagonist, such as a preparatant, is a highly selective NK1 receptor antagonist that crosses the blood-brain barrier and antagonizes NK1 receptors in the chemoreceptor trigger zone. Cannabinoids, such as nabilone, has antiemetic properties and is an appetite stimulant, which agonizes the, cannabinoid, ca sorry, the cannabinoid receptor in the vomiting center, resulting in decreased excitability. And finally, glucocorticoids such as dexmethasone has weak antiemetic properties, although the mechanism of action is unknown. Postulated mechanisms include direct anti-inflammatory effect, central action at glucocorticoid receptors in the nucleus tractus solitaris, or by decreased prostaglandin production. Okay, another common problem in ICU is constipation and a lot of patients require prokinetics. Can you please compare and contrast commonly used prokinetics in intensive care unit, that is erythromycin and metoclopramide? So both erythromycin and metoclopramide are used as prokinetics in the ICU. Erythromycin is a macrolide antibiotic, also used in the treatment of certain bacterial infections whilst metoclopramide is a D2 receptor antagonist, which is also used as an antiemetic. Their pharmacology can be thought of in terms of the pharmaceutics, pharmacokinetics, and pharmacodynamics. In terms of the pharmaceutics, erythromycin and metoclopramide are both available in intravenous and oral formulations. Metoclopramide can also be given via the intramuscular route. Pharmacokinetics can be divided into absorption, distribution, metabolism, and elimination. Absorption. Erythromycin tablets are enteric coated as the drug is destroyed by gastric acid, resulting in an oral bioavailability of 35%. 
Metoclopramide is well absorbed orally but undergoes extensive first pass metabolism, resulting in a wide range in oral bioavailability between 30 to 90 percent. Distribution Erythromycin diffuses readily into most body fluids and tissues, except for the CSF and the brain. Metoclopramide is distributed to most tissues, including the brain. Both of these drugs cross the placenta. Erythromycin is largely bound to plasma proteins, between 75 to 95%, whereas metoclopramide is less bound, at just 30%. Metabolism Erythromycin undergoes extensive hepatic metabolism by CYP3A4 and inhibits this enzyme by forming inactive complexes. Due to this inhibition, erythromycin can increase concentration of drugs which require CYP3A4 for metabolism. Metoclopramide undergoes some hepatic metabolism also by the cytochrome P450 pathway, but approximately 50% of metoclopramide is excreted unchanged. Elimination. Erythromycin is concentrated and excreted in bile and feces, but only 5% is excreted in the urine. It is not removed by dialysis. Metoclopramide is excreted in the urine and feces with a half-life of 4-6 to six hours, which can increase to 15 hours in severe renal impairment. Erythromycin has a half-life of just 1.5 hours, but can increase to 5 hours in anuric patients. Dose adjustment in renal failure is only necessary for erythromycin if the creatinine clearance is less than 10 mL an hour, but should be done with metoclopramide when the creatinine clearance is less than 40. Pharmacodynamics. Metoclopramide inhibits gastric smooth muscle relaxation produced by dopamine and sensitizes GIT smooth muscle to acetylcholine, causing smooth muscle contraction and resulting in prokinetic action. It also increases intestinal transit and gastric emptying by preventing relaxation of the gastric body and increasing contractions of the antrum, and by also relaxing the upper small intestine and pyloric sphincter, promoting peristalsis. Metoclopramide also increases the resting tone of the lower esophageal sphincter and increases esophageal contractions, thus reducing reflux. It also inhibits dopamine receptors in the chemoreceptor trigger zone, as mentioned earlier, which results in reduced nausea and vomiting. Erythromycin is a motilin receptor agonist in the gut and gallbladder, which promotes migrating motor complexes and results in prokinesis. Its antimicrobial properties are achieved by binding to the 50S subunit of bacterial ribosomes, which inhibits translocation of peptides needed for protein synthesis. Adverse effects of these drugs can be divided by a system. CNS effects. Metoclopramide can cause extrapyramidal symptoms such as tardive dyskinesia and dystonic reactions. Neuroleptic malignant syndrome and Parkinsonian symptome, symptoms can also result. Other CNS effects include restlessness, drowsiness, fatigue, and depression. Erythromycin, on the other hand, has few CNS effects but there have been reports of reversible hearing loss in patients with renal insufficiency and in those receiving high doses of erythromycin. Cardiovascular adverse effects. Erythromycin has been associated with prolongation of the QT interval and infrequent cases of arrhythmia and torsades. Metoclopramide can result in both hypertension and hypotension, as well as tachycardia, bradycardia, and rarely arrhythmias. Gastrointestinal effects. Due to their prokinetic action, both metoclopramide and erythromycin can cause nausea, diarrhea, and abdominal cramping. Erythromycin may also result in the overgrowth of non-susceptible organisms and C. diff. It can also cause hepatic dysfunction and very rarely pancreatitis. Other effects. Erythromycin and metoclopramide can occasionally cause allergic reactions while metoclopramide is, has been found to increase prolactin levels. Finally, considering the drug interactions, erythromycin can interact with multiple medications, including those metabolized by the CYP450 pathway, resulting in increased levels of medications such as carbamazepine, valproate, verapamil, colchicine, and diltiazem. 
There have also been reports of rhabdomyolysis in patients taking erythromycin and HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors due to the increased concentrations of the drug. Due to its QT prolonging effect, caution should be exercised when administering other medications that prolong the QT interval, as well as erythromycin. Metoclopramide also has numerous drug interactions. Anticholinergic drugs and narcotic analgesics can antagonize metoclopramide's prokinetic effects. Metoclopramide can also affect the rate of absorption of medications from the GIT. Absorptions of drugs such as paracetamol, aspirin, cyclosporin, and diazepam, which are absorbed from the small bowel, can be increased, whereas absorption of drugs such as cimetidine, penicillin, and digoxin, which are mainly absorbed from the stomach, may be decreased. Thank you. I can see on your face that looks like you've got a question for me. Always. Okay. So why did the stomach get depressed when it started taking a proton pump inhibitor? Jeez, where did you get all these questions from? I must say this time I need to back off. I'm sorry. I can't answer this question. Because it could never stay positive. <laughs> oh my God, Maddie. I, I thought I was getting better. I think I need to go back and do my homework again. Okay, so folks, that's the end of our uh, part one podcast on GI pharmacology. Next time we'll be back with another episode on GIT pharmacology. Till then, goodbye. Thanks for listening. See you next time.